The beauty of today's world is most of us are given so much opportunity to develop and establish our own personal styles. There are many different aesthetics to choose from to the point where sometimes it's honestly overwhelming. The preference for one aesthetic over another is often highly subjective, and lines tend to be blurred between different styles. For those of us who love wearing and making vintage or historical fashion, the same can very much be said. At what point does historical become vintage, or is there even truly a defining factor? That's why I reached out to Karolina Zabrowska, a daily wearer of vintage fashion who also has a lot of experience with historical costuming. Since I'm a daily wearer of historical fashion, I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to facilitate a conversation about vintage versus historical fashion and what the concepts even mean. Hello, Karolina. Hi, Vasi. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. It's been so long, like two yeah. whole months. <laughs> Basically um, forgot what you look like. What decade would you say that the shift from historical to vintage fashion begins to happen? The way I always use these phrases, and I, I think it's the way it's often described when people are selling things from this era. So everything post-1920s I call vintage, and everything pre-1920s I call historical. It's a way of differentiating things that works because most people sort of think this way. At the same time, I, I feel like obviously things that are vintage can also be called historical because they were worn during specific parts of history. So in this case, it goes both ways. So it's yeah, it's all all around messy. We would benefit from like discussing this as a society, like what phrases are kind of outdated? What do we call things? And I actually do the same as you. 1920s is kind of that that point. At what point does the 1920s then shift into being, you know, antique or historical? In 10 years, suddenly it'll be 110 years old. At that point, do we start to consider 1920s to be historical then? Or is, is it going to continue to shift? Yeah, I think especially when it comes to the new decades getting cold vintage, like the, the 2000s are now cold vintage. I just think it's not good to use the same phrase for such a wide span of fashion history because obviously an item from 2000s like, I don't know, a tracksuit doesn't have the same historical value and value as an object as a 1930s evening gown. Like there is not a single person that wants to decide like, okay, I think we should move on from this point now. I don't know who is supposed to do that. Like we don't have a fashion authority that is like, okay, <laughs> or a linguistic authority that will like, you know, shift things up, but things are definitely Kind of stretching out at this point. I mean, I heard people say that something that's over 20 years old becomes vintage by default, but then like a hundred years from now, would just anything during that time span be vintage? I feel like there is a need for a new name for things that are sort sort of in between or out of these time frames. Neo vintage? Can we make that? Neo vintage up? sounds nice. Post yeah. vintage. <laughs> post it's like post punk. <laughs> Yeah. Post, post vintage. I like that. Yeah. We should create a like a new movement of post vintage. Yeah. So not that we'd like partake in it, but you know, we'd at least encourage For it. other people. Yeah, you know, just make rules for other people. It sounds yeah, like to follow. Where is the line between like historical fashion and modern fashion? Because we see historical fashion on a person, but it's a modern person wearing historical fashion. Like is your fashion the, the clothes that you wear, would you call that historical fashion? Or are you a modern person and that's just one of the parts of modern fashion, like a particular, a very tiny trend, because I'm guessing there's not a lot of people that, that dress like you, but still you're a modern person participating in, in fashion, like wearing clothes, which is basically fashion, like that's wearing clothes. Um, so just because not many people do that, could you say that that's not modern fashion then? Or is it? <laughs> if you shortened your skirts to like knee length, would that be a modern dress just because it's shorter? Or uh, if you have a historically inspired garment, that's a modern garment. Yeah. Just all those like nuances make it really hard for me to like try and wrap my head around what we call historical fashion and why. And I think ultimately too, it's sort of like this fact of we need terms in order to define things, in order to like have identity a lot of the time, I think. And it's true. I get asked a lot of the time if I live like a historical lifestyle and I'm like, I work in tech, you know, I have a phone, I have a, a, a computer. I like to garden and take care of animals and churn butter and do all that stuff, sure. But that's just like trying to keep alive some of the old forgotten crafts, I think. So there are some people obviously who like live more of the Victorian life. In the, the day, 
it is modern people wearing historical fashion and I guess... Yeah, they, they didn't go back in time. That's no. still like modern people making choices for themselves, but they're still modern people dressed in a particular way. Yeah, and I think this is also where a lot of the, you know, vintage style, not vintage values stuff comes in too. A lot of the people who are in historical fashion are actually very modern in regards to their ideals and values, and the same goes with vintage fashion. I feel like maybe it has to do with how subcultures, like fashion subcultures, were developing where people actually did express like their political views through clothing and now maybe people associate what you wear with your views. If someone sees someone that's dressed conservatively, they would also assume they have traditional views and values. So that, but also in the modern era where uh, clothing is so far like detached from your views, you can have someone dressed all pink that listens to metal. It's not as uh, intertwined as it used to be, I feel like. Yeah, it's important to like note that when expressing yourself that this is not necessarily like who I am, it's just the aesthetic that I'm into. When I lived in Iceland, people often thought I was like Amish or something, or like living in one of the communes out in Iceland, because I'd wear a bonnet a lot. My friend, we were walking through Ikea once there, and she's like, yeah, everyone keeps like looking at you really weird and and it's just so annoying and why can't they just, you know, accept that that's just, you're just wearing a bonnet, it doesn't have to mean anything more than that. Yeah. Yeah, just, like, just yeah, let the girl wear her bonnet. <laughs> That's the beauty of this modern world. Things can contradict each other and still work. And I think, in fact, that's where we get some of the coolest fashions are things that are very much anachronistic. Things that in, kind of tie in the modern with the historical. I love doing that when I'm in, in a historical costume. And that's actually the easiest way to make people to stop staring at me is like being on my phone. Because then they're like, oh, so she's not for me to take pictures because she's actually doing something like she is a person it's not just like a character in a costume what would you say are your favorite and least favorite parts about wearing vintage fashion and then also historical fashion since you have experience with that as well for events i'm guessing my favorite part about wearing vintage fashion is that it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> and it stays pretty like it doesn't go out of fashion I love that like I remember the pain of like having to stop wearing things because they weren't cool anymore or they weren't fashionable anymore or you could tell that they were from like a couple of years prior but just the joy of wearing pretty things without the guilt of them like only getting worn like half a year um, is something that I really enjoy about vintage fashions. What I dislike about wearing vintage is um, sort of the assumptions that people make. Even in your most casual outfit, people will assume you're classy, you're elegant, you're fancy. You kind of also have to uh, dress down to certain uh, places that you go to or meetings that you do. Because, you know, wearing what would be appropriate in the 1940s is probably going to freak people out nowadays. So whenever I'm going to, to a wedding, I'm always like, I really don't want to like upstage the bride or make her feel uncomfortable. So I'm always like dressing down. You know, these types of clothes do draw attention. Obviously, they're completely different from, people are wear from what people are wearing. And they're quite flamboyant sometimes. Like, <laughs> you know, some of the hats are really crazy. I think it's the same with historical fashion, you know, you're always really overdressed for situations. Even in a wrapper, it's still kind of considered fancy. I don't know even if it's like linen. With historical fashions, again, I love like all the details and all of the accessories and layers and how like structured it is. It's probably a bit annoying to wear outside because people will assume that you're basically their property and you're there for their amusement. So they will like stop you a lot of times. And, you know, I don't mind talking to people and explaining what I'm wearing, but at some point it's like that's the 15th time someone stopped you that day and you're on your way somewhere and you're stressed out about missing a bus or something. So that aspect of historical clothing is par partially, I would say, why I decided to dress vintage. Because I do feel uh, really comfortable in like Edwardian clothing, for example, late Victorian, but I just don't have the patience for that sort of behavior. And I feel like with 1940s, it, it already like crosses the line of looking like regular modern clothing. So people are not so bold in trying to like interact with you. Uh, so I, I'm in like my safe zone wearing that kind of stuff. I think also for me personally, it's it can be really comfortable because I feel like especially as the weather changes, you're 
almost always quite comfortable. People are kind of surprised when I say I'm not hot when it's really warm out or that I'm not cold when it's really cold out. And it's just because you get the layers down so well and you kind of are so much more involved in how your materials react that you learn what is appropriate for a certain type of, of weather report. That kind of just shocks people, I think, because we're not used to seeing clothes seasonally really anymore. Not in the way that it was historically or even in vintage. I have like a skin sensitivity to like synthetics fibers. So I can't wear it for more than maybe like a day. That I think is a really hard thing about modern fashion is finding good natural fiber garments that are also like cute and aren't just a little linen smock dress, which is really pretty too. It can be pretty, but you don't want to wear a little linen dress to everything. With, with historical, you also always have that option of, of the natural fiber as well. And it just makes it way easier. Maybe it is that modern fashion sort of likes to associate natural fibers and natural fabrics with like the casual side of fashion. You know, a wool and coat would not necessarily be like a fancy garment. It's just something that you sort of like pop on. Um, same with like linen, cotton even, like it's all sort of working garments in a way. And I wonder if that's because they wrinkle. We hate wrinkles nowadays. Like whenever I post, uh, you know, a photo of something and there is a, at least like a tiny sign of a wrinkle somewhere. Someone will point it out and be like, that's a wrinkle, you didn't iron this. It's impossible to keep them like not wrinkled throughout the day. And I think that's why rayon became such a, it was often marketed as the ironless fabric. And I, I think that is very much the case because with historical fashion, wrinkles are almost inevitable. You would have to be like a magician to not make silk wrinkle somehow. It, it's just, that's not how it is, you know? Things yeah, like you, you would basically have to stand around and like not move the whole day. Which decades do you feel like garner the most attention when you wear them in public? It can be either historical or vintage. Honestly, anything that features a longer skirt, people will always pay more attention to that. And I don't think they recognize different eras, to be honest. Anything like pre-1920s will draw their attention because their skirt is floor length. So all of the accessories that are not necessarily worn nowadays, which is like huge hats, the big hair of the 18th century, whatever you wear under your skirt, all the skirt support. The further it is from how people dress nowadays, the more they will pay attention to that. <laughs> I sometimes prefer just the comfort over looking nice. <laughs> So I don't want to stress about my my skirt getting anywhere, but That's if it's like the if it's the working skirt, then I think most of your uh, dresses have this sort of like comfortable length where it's not completely floor length or trained or anything. Uh, so I think those could actually work nicely. It's funny because I was about to to say that's where I think working class clothing deserves a, a big push for exposure because in our community it's almost only ever the clothing of the elite that we see yeah. because it it garners attention because people like pretty colorful things. Princessy things. Yeah, exactly. I think now there's starting to be kind of a push for people who are like, well, what did just your average everyday person wear? And it's like, well, they definitely didn't wear skirts that were dragging in the mud all the time. Yeah. You know, you see so many working class um, depictions. We don't really have a lot of photos, obviously. The few paintings and stuff that we do have People are generally wearing like pretty short length garments. Why do you think that it's invaluable that we study and we protect both vintage and historical fashion? And fashion history as a part of, of history in general is still quite a young, young branch, I would say. I can't imagine people in 19th century taking it as seriously as we do nowadays. So it's still developing. Part of what's so difficult for us to research is because like people would not save up their clothes they would either like wear them to death or they would remake them into something new so a lot of the excellent garments are they were modified at some point so i feel like what we have we should preserve because it's gonna make it so much easier for people to study it in the future and and we can also develop that branch of history better and fashion history is not only about fashion because it's history so all of the aspects of life put into garments which i love about it it's like you know the politics uh, why certain fabrics were used that the um, um how it was manufactured who manufactured that who wore it why uh why couldn't they wear something else when did they wear it when did they stop wearing it it's all of that it's the part of history that is difficult to research because it's not taken seriously 
So whatever we have, we should cherish and um, make sure we, we like, take lessons from it. And everybody used to wear clothes. Yeah, <laughs> good point. So not everybody used to live in a certain country or, you know, eat a certain food, but we all used to wear clothing, right? That's the kind of common thread that we all have is pretty much the day that we're born, we get put in some sort of garment, whether it's a blanket or, or something else, but something, some sort of textile ends up surrounding us. If we go way back, clothing is a way that we revolutionized existence because it allowed us to survive in really hard conditions. I think that's part of why it's not taken as seriously today is because we don't have a same relationship with clothing that we used to as humans. When we look at historical versus vintage undergarments, because undergarments were such a heavy part of both historical and vintage fashion, unlike today, I mean, we obviously have bras and things like that, but they're not nearly as structured or as complex as they were before. During the kind of era that you like, like the 1930s, 40s, 50s, obviously there were girdles, and I'm used to wearing corsets every day. What, what is the experience of, of wearing a girdle like for you versus a corset? And is it more comfortable? Is it less comfortable? So I'd say like neither a corset or a, nor a girdle would be something that I'd wear every day, simply because I don't have to. I wear tights instead of stockings because I, I find that more comfortable. But when I do wear stockings, the kind of girdles, girdles that are just there to hold the stockings up, that's fine, that doesn't do anything to me. That's just like a part of, of my underwear. When I do have a bone girdle on though, um, I do find it a bit more uh, sort of invasive than a corset. I think because a girdle wraps around your body more because of the elastic pieces in it. So like if I do wear a corset and I, let's say, breathe out, there is some space between my body and the corset. Like there is, if I move to the right, there is space on the left. Your body is still kind of, it still exists inside. <laughs> Whereas a girdle, when the elastic wraps around you, it's like there, you cease to exist outside of the girdle. It's like the girdle is you. <laughs> it consumes like, you, it just swallows you whole. It just swallows you. So I think maybe that's why, and I think that's also why people hate Spanx nowadays. There is no layer of air between your body and the Spanx. And I feel like, that's something that the elastic parts in the girdle do. But there are also girdles without elastic panels. There are also girdles without boning. So it obviously depends on what type you wear and, and what occasion for and like what for. Uh, some people obviously wear it for like um, the nice shape that they get. I don't really feel the need for that in the 1940s clothing because it's quite tailored. It works well enough for me. So it would also be a different experience for someone who uses girdles as shapewear. I think I wore a girdle once or twice and it's pretty well fitted and everything but I just could not get over the feeling of it against my skin and the elastic and everything. I just I found it really uncomfortable even though I find corsetry so comfortable and I think that's kind of interesting because like you said it's very much kind of why people dislike Spanx. I think a lot of it has to do with the elastic and the fact that it is just so form-fitting. Because corsets are fit to you, but they're not skin tight. And I also think it might have to do something to do with length. Because the girdles are usually, they cover your butt and they usually go down to your thighs. So I think that's also what gives you kind of um, an additional layer of discomfort because you can't fully move your legs the way you would without it. Whereas in a corset, the leg movement is not really limited. Which decades do you feel the most confident wearing or that make you feel just the most you. I feel like it would be 1940s and 1900s. 1940s because it's just comfy and it just, funnily enough, even if I wear like 1950s or 1930s for things like photo shoot or something, I feel dressed up. Like I need to get back in my 1940s clothes before I'm like, Ooh, okay, that that is me. That was a costume. That's me. If I wasn't aware of people would think of me or like the way they would interact with me and if I wasn't aware that I wouldn't be comfortable in the modern uh, world I would probably wear 1900s so that is my plan for my retirement everybody <laughs> I'll just uh, I'll start wearing 1900s stuff then because if you're saying retirement I'm assuming you'll be of retirement age yeah so would you start dressing like retired people would have dressed back then like in their 60s you know oh, how like, maybe yeah. and, like, that would be nice well, then you'd probably have to dress late Victorian. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> or 
Or you can just say you like 1920s and then you could dress yeah, up Barbie. I'd in. just be like the 1920s grandma that still wears 1900s. Or I could just screw it and wear teens fashion from the era. No one would notice anyway. I'm starting to really get into 1840s because I like how kind of refined it is. I like mm. when my voice cracked there. Like, <laughs> are you emotional about it? Yeah. Oh. 1840s are just really... You love them so much. I just, I just love them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love how refined it is and how understated some of it is while still being kind of complex but not in decoration. They're very, sure. I would say, like somber in a way, which I kind of like. Do you feel like historical fashion, um, and in this sense I mean replica historical fashion, or vintage fashion is more sustainable? Mm, yeah, I would definitely say so. I mean, unless you're like making historical replicas for a single photo and then never wearing it. But if you're uh, wearing the clothing either to like a couple of events or um, or on a daily basis, then yeah, definitely, because it doesn't go out of fashion. So as long as you're using it, you made a piece once and then it serves you for a long time. I have pieces that I've been wearing for like at this point probably like six seven years and i'm still going to wear them for for probably seven more if not 10 20. obviously it also depends if like your measurements are changing but then again a lot of vintage pieces have been made with that in mind so you have a lot of pieces where you have really wide seam allowance or you have pieces where the hem is like this huge so you can undo it and if if you need a longer hem, there you go. Also, the fact that I can just continue to wear the clothing and I don't have to worry about it just not being cool anymore. Yeah, that's a huge thing. There's none of that pressure. Yeah, yeah. Having to appease the, the masses, society, you know. Even like your friends after a while, they accept that you're kind of, you've jumped out of the wagon. So they don't expect you to like live up to their fashion standards. And I'm not saying my friends are some sort of like fashion police. But still, like, there is this peer pressure, like, if you see people changing their style over and over, you think, like, oh, I should probably do that as well. When you're sort of, like, out of this fashion timeline, it doesn't really matter anymore, because, like, people do accept that you're kind of out, and you don't have to follow it anymore, which is also kind of relieving. I feel like sometimes, too, it can be a little bit isolating, because there's a level of, like, normalcy that comes with following fashion trends and just pop culture in general. And when you get out of it, you kind of get outside of that bubble and of that community. Because like, every time we talk about a certain topic, essentially we're a part of a small conversational community. It can feel really kind of lonely. And that's where I think having friends in historical fashion is so important. Because at least then you have each other to lean on and kind of all feel isolated together so then you don't feel isolated or you can just complain to each other about how isolated you feel which is nice i think that goes with any alternative clothing style because if we look at like goth for instance that's a really good example there's a whole culture that comes around goth fashion and i think that that's the thing is fashion is such a personal catalyst into creating community and into finding people that are like you because you all dress similar it takes a certain amount of confidence to dress in something that is so different from modern fashion. So sometimes it feels crazy, but then you meet up with someone that wears the same and you're like, okay, so I'm not that crazy because that person does it too and they're pretty nice. Definitely the aspect of community makes, it, it sort of like grounds you, reassures you that what you're doing is not that weird and you know, it's, it's okay to just dress up in whatever you feel like. I think you can be surprised too by like how many people are kind of into vintage and historical and you didn't even expect it. I think that a lot of people would wear vintage um, or historical if they found the confidence to do it. Because a lot of my friends are like, this is great, this is so nice, I could never do it. And I'm like, you could, just do it. Like, life is short. Um, no one will judge you for it, and if they do, they're not worth your attention. It's really up to the person to decide what they want to wear, and, and you shouldn't let other people dictate that for you. You have to try and find your own joy, I think, in life, and clothing is a great way to do that. And I guess that goes even beyond vintage and historical. If something appeals to a person, then, like you said, life is too short to not to not give it a go and worst case scenario like you just change your style it's not it's yeah not the world not a big deal experimenting with your style is a great way to develop personal confidence and also just to get to know more about yourself because it's a direct reflection of, of kind of who you are inside i think or it could be exact opposite because i know some goth people that are like really happy but <laughs> 
but that's also cool too you know it can be like yeah. a statement. good um, for them well thanks so much for being a part of this and thank you for having me <laughs> yeah it was such a good pleasure to talk to you and and discuss some of our thoughts about vintage versus historical yeah i, I enjoyed that yeah me too <laughs> Hopefully this discussion has made vintage versus historical a little bit clearer, but there's a good chance that it actually only made things more murky. At the end of the day, we're talking about concepts here that don't exactly have someone regulating their definitions. And sometimes that's frustrating, but at other times it actually might be a positive thing. If you'd like to learn about what it's like to wear historical fashion daily as a male, be sure to watch this video next. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another video.